do it three times. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Do it again. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. One more time. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. The Lord has made. We will rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. So, Brother uh, Timmy. Hebrews chapter number 9. Uh, we're going to look at verses 15 through verse number 22. And uh, we're going to look at Christ the minister and the mediator of the new covenant. As I always say in every lesson, as the book of Hebrews is written two and four, first generated converted, first generation converted Jews who are struggling with the Old Testament, you know, and the New Testament. Well, at the time it was the Old Covenant and now this New Covenant. So we're going to look at that tonight. In verse number 15, the Bible says, And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, uh, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the, prom the promise of eternal inheritance. Verse 16, uh, For where a testament is, uh, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator live, liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. I know a lot of this is going to sound, sound a bit uh, confusing, but we're going to break it down and look at it. Verse 19, For when Moses had spoken every precept at all to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wood and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and, the, and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God had enjoined unto you, Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, the Bible says there's no remission. So we'll go ahead and jump right into it tonight. I want to look at, first of all, verse number 15. We look at number one, that Christ is the mediator of the new covenant, the new testament. Uh, that another word for testament is, is the word covenant. Covenant is the promise. Verse number 15, again as we start out, And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. That's the new covenant. Uh, and, and that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression, that were under the first testament. That's the old covenant. That's the, the law. Amen. Uh, they which are called might receive the promise of internal, eternal inheritance. 
So as we start out here in verse 15, it says, and for this cause, we want to go back to verse 14 where it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? There's the question. And then as Paul says here, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant, of the new testament. Amen? And so just a few things here. Letter A is how. How? And that's simply by death through redemption. That's how. Uh, number one, I'm going to show you a few verses tonight here. He died for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 6, it says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also receive, Paul says. He said, by, by the way, in order for you to be a preacher, a pastor of a, a, of a, 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 a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church, you've got to be saved, amen? Amen. And that's what Paul is saying here. He said, listen, what I'm giving you, I've already received. And what is that? How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. We have talked about that this morning in our Bible study. There's some things that we should stand for. Number one, we ought to stand for that Jesus is the head of the church. Amen. Number two, we looked at that that we ought to stand for that, that the Holy Spirit is our administrator. He leads and guides us into all truth. We ought to listen to the Holy Spirit in our life. And number three, we looked at that the Word of God is our message. And what is it in the message of the Word of God? What the Scriptures speak. That's what Paul is saying here. According to the Scriptures. There ought to, you, whatever church that, that I believe every believer goes to, should go to, is a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. If you're standing before a pastor and he doesn't open the Word of God as he's preaching, you find another church. If, and at times I, I see this where I see a, a preacher get up there, he'll read one verse of Scripture, close the Bible, and then he'll, he'll, he'll never mention another verse of Scripture ever again for the next 45 minutes to an hour. Find another church. You've got to preach according to the Scriptures. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 15, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So how? Well, it's by, by death through redemption. Number one, he died for us. Number two, he redeemed us. Amen? Romans 3, verse 24, being justified freely by grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1, verse number 30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Galatians 3, verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed of every one that hangeth on a tree. Titus 2, verse 14, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Amen? So, number one, we find that Christ is the mediator of the New Testament, the New Covenant. We looked at A, how. We'll look at B, why. Letter B is why. And simply to forgive sins and to give an eternal inheritance. Again, all of this is, is, is titled Christ the Minister and the Mediator of the New Covenant. The New Testament. And we look at that sometimes. We say, well, that's the New Testament of the Bible. That's not, that's not what this is saying. It's saying, again, a new covenant. It's, it's, we're no longer under the law. Now we're under grace. We're in the dispensation, uh, dispensation of grace. 
I think a lot of uh, Christians fall short of today is they'll say, well, we don't have to read the Old Testament anymore. We don't have to listen to the Old Testament. We don't have to study the Old Testament because we're no longer Old Testament believers. We are now New Testament believers. You still need the Old Testament. The Bible said the Old Testament is there for our learning. But thank God we are under the age of grace. And simply why is to forgive sins and to give an eternal, eternal inheritance. Number one, to forgive sins. Galatians 1 verse 4, Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from his pres this present evil wo world, according to the will of the Father of God and our Father. A Galatians or Colossians 1 verse 14, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. 1 Peter 2 verse 24, Who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye are healed. 1 Peter 3 verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for, the, for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So the why is this? To forgive sin, and of course, number two, we've got it right here on the heading, is to give eternal inheritance. Acts chapter 20, verse 32, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Acts 26 verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So praise the Lord, we have forgiveness of sin, but not only that, but praise the Lord, we have an eternal inheritance. So why is Christ the mediator of the New Testament? is to give us eternal inheritance. Colossians 1 verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of inheritance of the saints and light. Number two, verse number 16 through verse 17. I'm sorry if that's too small, but... I try to get it up there as best I can. <laughs> I try to get as much in there as I can so we can show you the scriptures, but um, I think on YouTube it, it looks much bigger. But Verse 16 through verse 17, we find number two, at last will and testament are not, in, are not in effect until the testator's death. So without the death of Christ, where would we be today? We would still be under that old covenant. Yeah, but how can we be under the covenant if we're not here? Exactly. We would, we, in, in reality, we, would, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have salvation at all, or have the opportunity for salvation. Because He came into His own, and His own received Him not. And He, he expanded the the uh, uh, the olive branch, I guess you could say, unto the Gentiles, and the Gentiles were engrafted into that olive tree. He was, he was, he was the Paul was the uh, he was the apostle to the Gentiles. That's right. Uh, Hebrews nine verse sixteen through seventeen, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Makes sense, doesn't it? Letter A, why? Because of Christ's death, who obtained a better covenant? Established upon better promises. Amen? Hebrews 8, verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also... He is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Letter B, because of Christ's perfect and sinless life, 
He sacrificed Himself once and for all to put away sins forever. So letter A, because of Christ's death. Letter B, because of Christ's perfect and sinless life. Because if you look at verse 23 through 28, I've got it up there where it says, It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in heaven should be purified with these. For the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that He... Uh, should offer himself often as the high priest entered the holy place every year with, with blood of others, but then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And it is, uh, it is, uh, it is, it, and as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear to the second time without sin unto salvation. How many times did Christ go into the presence of God to place the blood upon the mercy seat of God in heaven? How many times? Once. Now, here on earth, they did that every year, didn't they? It was for the sins of the people every year. It was never permanent. It was never satisfied. And so there again, by this, by this scripture here, that's also proof you cannot lose your salvation. How can you get saved again and again? How many times is Christ going to offer His blood again and again? The Bible said He's done it once. And all you have to do is accept Him. And if you truly accepted Him into your life, as your Savior, there's no need to be saved again and again and again. And I know there's quite a bit of churches, uh, uh, you know, out there today that that is their, their belief and their doctrine. And what it is, it, it puts an intimidation and a fear upon the congregation. And therefore, they rely more upon works and good deeds and, and uh, uh, things, uh, uh, works unto the Lord to keep your salvation Absolutely. The Catholic Church, the Pentecostal Church teach that too, you know, uh, at least a greater part of the Pentecostal churches do. And, um, and there's some Baptist churches as well. There's some Baptist churches that, that I've, I've come across that believe that, that you can lose your salvation. That's their Calvinistic Baptist church. Uh, there's a few of them here in town. Um, and and uh, I know one, he's a good, he's a good man. I know him personally. He's a good, he's a good man, but he believes that you can lose your salvation. And I told him, I said, well, that's one we'll always disagree with because I, cannot, I, I can't believe that, that, that you can lose your salvation. Because here's the thing, if it doesn't take works to get saved, why does it take works to stay saved? And so that's, that's a misdoctrine. But there again, you can't be uh, you know, saved over and over and over again. I believe once you get saved, you're always saved. Now, you could rededicate your life unto the Lord, but that's not to say you get saved again uh, because that kind, of, that kind of teaching always puts people in fear of, well, I've messed up and I've done wrong. You know, now I've got to get saved again. He no longer loves me and he no longer... That's what the Jews were doing. That's why they had so many sacrifices. He got rid of the sacrifices. That's right. That's right. So... So, yeah, and it's amazing to me that, that you have a, uh, you'll, you'll preach a doctrine uh, of that, that, you know, once saved, always saved, and people, it almost seems like they would rather live or, or uh, follow a teaching of you can lose your salvation and you depend on me to do more works to keep my salvation rather than just trust the Lord that God's given you liberty, not a license, but liberty, and uh, that you'll not be judged for your sins when you stand before Him, but you will be judged for the works you've done in your body, both whether they be good or whether they be bad, the Bible says. But yeah, um, you know, he, uh, Jesus, Jesus died. Uh, his, his, he was perfect and He was sinless. Amen? All right, let's go to number three. 
That's good. That's good. Amen. Good stuff. Uh, number three is the institution of the first covenant or testament shows that all things are cleansed by the blood. It's necessary. You must be washed in the blood. You must be cleansed by the blood. Again, Hebrews 9, verse 18 through 22, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and with the scarlet wool and and hiss up and sprinkle both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God had enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, the Bible said, of course, there's no remission. And uh, we'll finish this here tonight uh, as we get through these verses but letter A, Moses dedicated the covenant or the testament with blood. In Exodus 24, verse 6 through 8, And Moses took the, the, the half of the blood and put it in a basin, and the half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the, blood, he took the book of the covenant and read, read in the audience of the people. And they said, All that the Lord hath said, we uh, will we do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it upon the people and said, Behold the, la the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. And you see, this is what Paul is saying here. He's referencing this verse of Scripture in Exodus chapter 24. So we see, first of all, that Moses dedicated the covenant or the testament with blood. Number letter B Moses dedicated the tabernacle with blood. Now, who is the tabernacle today, church? Huh? No? We are. We are the tabernacle of the Holy Ghost of God. Amen? So, first of all, we see this covenant, this New Testament. It was purged with blood, right? Moses did that. And number two, we see that Moses dedicated the tabernacle with blood. Do we see the connection yet? <coughs> Exodus 8, verse 14 through 19. Here's the verse for that. And the Bible said, And he brought the bullock for the sin offering, and Aaron and his son laid his hands upon the head of the bullock for the sin offerings. And he slew it, and Moses took the blood, and he put it upon the horn of the altar round about with his finger. And he purified the altar and poured the blood upon the bottom of the altar and sanctified it to, rec to make reconciliation upon it. And he took all of the fat that was upon the inward and the, and the cool above the, the liver and the two kidneys and their fat and Moses burned it upon the altar. But the bullock and his hide, his flesh and his dung, he burned with fire without the camp. As the Lord commanded Moses... And he brought the ram uh, for the burnt offering, and Aaron and his son laid their hands upon the head of the ram, and he killed it, and Moses sprinkled the blood upon the altar round about. So not only did Moses dedicate the covenant, the, the testament with blood, he also dedicated the tabernacle, letter C. Let's be the next page. Moses showed us that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Leviticus 17, verse 11, for the, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. I mean, here's the thing. It's been in the Bible for how many years? The life of the flesh is in the blood. And it wasn't but just within the last 100 and probably 25 years, doctors have just figured out that there is life in the blood. You know, before that, they would bleed you out. Yep. They would bleed you out, and then they realize, now wait a minute, there's life in the blood. Well, if they would read their Bible, amen? For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your soul. Not works, not the church, not membership, blood. Amen. Number one. Christ shed His blood for the remission of sins. Amen. Matthew 26, verse 26 through 28. 
And as they were eaten, look here. We all know Jesus took bread and He blessed it. And He broke it. And He gave it to His disciples. And said what? Take, eat, this is my body. And then He took the cup and He gave thanks and, and gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the what? Ooh. Are we talking about the New Testament of the Bible? No, we're talking about that New Covenant. And the disciples knew exactly what he was saying. It's a new covenant. Which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Number two, Christ's blood justifies us. Romans 5 verse 8 and 9, But God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, what Christ died for us much more then being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him again there's blood next page number three i just got two more and i'll be done christ shed christ shed blood for our sins provides a new and a living way what a joy it is to see a change isn't it through, through Christ. You see the change of people, right? What is that? That's a, that's a new and living way. Amen? Hebrews 10, verse 16 through 22, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. How can, how can the Lord, listen, let me back up for a minute. How can the Lord say, I will no more remember the iniquity of your sins, but then bring it back up later? Think about that. If you could lose your salvation, that, that, makes God a liar. that would make God a liar. Absolutely. If you could lose your salvation, then that's simply saying, oh, He's going to bring back your sins. Well, the Bible says He'll remember it no more. He'll cast as far as the east is from the west, right? You still have to answer for the works you've done in your body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. But He has died for your sins. You'll still stand before Him, but you'll not lose that eternal inheritance. You'll never be sinless, but we could strive to sin less, right? But you'll never lose that eternal inheritance. And my question is, as those that do believe that, you know, you can lose your salvation, how far do you have to go? You know, what did Jesus say? How many times, how many, what was the number Jesus said that you have to forgive? Seven times, seven. Seven times 70, right? You say, well, that's 490 times. Well, I got about, I, I've now 439. Whew, I got one more to go, right? That's not what that's saying. The, the word, the number seven is the number of the completion, right? In the Bible. So when Nebuchadnezzar, let me give you an example. When Nebuchadnezzar said, turn the furnace, what? Seven times hotter, right? It wasn't that he had a dial up there that said one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever. No, he, that literally means complete. Go as hot, as hot as you can make it. I imagine that furnace, if there was rivets, that, those rivets were probably shaken. That was so hot. And so when the Lord says, here's what I'm, he said, now, 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 and the disciples were asking, well, how many times should we forgive? He said, I want you to forgive uh, seven times 70, which is literally saying, the Lord's saying, you forgive until you just keep forgiving and forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. There's no end to the forgiving. That's what Jesus was saying. And so how can he remember your sins no more and then you can lose your salvation and then, and then, then stand before the Lord and say, and he say, I never knew you. Depart from me. Right? If you've never, listen, if you, you're saved, you walk with the Lord and the Lord knows you and, and you're serving the Lord as those that will say in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and 22, Lord, Lord, did I not, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not cast out devils in your name? Did I not do all these many wonderful works in your name? And then the Lord's going to look over and he says, I'm going to profess unto them, I never knew thee. Depart from me, 
thou workers of iniquity. If he knew you, you were saved, and you lose your salvation, how can he rightfully say, I never knew who you were? Because you were never saved in the first place. I likened it unto uh, a relationship, a husband and wife relationship. And by the way, that's the way we are with Christ. We are the bride of Christ, right? So here you are, a husband and wife relationship, and you're living with one another. You have an intimate relationship with one another, right? You know you have that agape love, as the Bible says, that Christ has for His church, where He gave Himself for it, right? And you and your, you and your wife or your husband, uh, yourself, you're, 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 you have that intimate relationship, and you've seen each other in, in the most intimate ways, right? And then you stand before the judge, and, and, and here the husband looks over and says, I never knew who you were. Could he rightfully say that? No. no. Of course you knew who she was. Of course she knows who you are. Why? Because you had that relationship with one another. How can God rightfully say, if you're saved and you lose your salvation, so you think, how can God rightfully look over at you as a bride and say, well, you know what, come to think of it, I never knew you. Well, that would be a lie. You know why? You know how he can rightfully say that? Because you were never married in the first place. Amen? So you can't lose your salvation no matter what. And, I, and that's the one thing inmates struggle with most. And, and I've seen that in the prison. They struggle with that so much. And not all of them, not all of them, but majority of them I've come across, they really do. And I think because, because their punishment is ever before them. They're living in their punishment, right? And it seems like there's no forgiveness from the state. And they're thinking, how can God forgive me? I, there's, I've, got to, there, I've got to continue to work and work and work and work because there's going to come a time where I'm going to lose my salvation. And I keep encouraging them, you're not, you're not. No, you're wrong, you're wrong. And I mean, I'm telling you, I've had some inmates get mad at me. Just so mad, they raging. You're wrong, preacher. And I said, how can you think that God would give up on you? And when I said that, the guy looked at me and he goes, well, you know, it's not that you can lose your salvation, it's that you can forfeit. And I look at him and I said, but how can, how, how would you, why would you want to forfeit it? That relationship. If you're serving a loving God and you have a wonderful relationship with the Lord, and look, it, 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 why would you give up that relationship? Why would a bride that, that is in a relationship with a man where the man is providing everything for the woman and he's providing not only physically, not only financially, but emotionally and spiritually, and you think it's heaven on earth, why would you leave him? And you know what the belief is today that I hear? Right, Robert? They think you can divorce God. You've given up. Why would you do that? You were never saved in the first place. Why? The Bible says now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter in the holiest of the, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh, and, and, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near unto a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled for, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And then number four, and I'm done here. Christ washed us from our sins in His own blood. Revelation 1 verse 5. Here it is, the end of the Bible, right? The revelation of God. By the way, the book of Revelation, if you, when you're reading it, it's in three parts. You have to break it up into three parts. Very simple. Chapter number one is past. That's all past tense. That's already happened. And that's the thing about the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the most controversial book of the Bible. Why? Because the majority of it from chapter 4 to chapter number 22 is, is all future. It's, it hasn't taken place. And that's why we argue so much because we think we know it. And you know what I say to preachers? Or they'll, get, they'll get mad at me. I say, look, I ain't splitting hairs with you. I'm not. 
Because even though I, I, I think, well, I, I you know, believe what the Bible is saying here, and I, and I think so, and I believe it, but here's the reality. So what? Are we going to allow that to hinder us to witness to people, to see people saved? And, and if we're not careful, we will get into the battling of the small, minor things of the Word of God. I found that in the prison. That's what the devil wants. I found in the prison, these guys, they, they read the Bible, and they study the Bible, and they read the Bible, and they study the Bible, and they'll look at you and go, you're wrong, you're wrong. And I'm going, but what does it matter? Does this interfere with people getting saved? No. Okay, then. We're focusing on the wrong things. We've got to keep the main thing the main thing. But in chapter number 1, it's past tense. And here's what the Bible said in, in, in chapter 1, verse number 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us. And the Bible said he washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's the main thing. And that's what we talked about this morning. The fourth thing that we ought to stand for this morning, as I was mentioning, was that we ought, to, we ought to stand for the message. And that is Jesus saves. And He'll change your life. That's what we ought to focus on. We get so, you know, and, and, and I tell these men as we're out soul winning, listen, if people want to get in a debate about religion or about churches, don't. Just walk away. Why? Because that's going to hinder you from going to another door where possibly somebody is ripe and ready to answer that door and receive Jesus Christ. But the devil's using that to get you all twisted and tied up. And you know what that, all that leads to? You're mad, he's mad, and everybody else is mad. And nobody knew any better. Nobody got any smarter. Nobody got any wiser in all of it. And was God glorified? Nope. Was the Bible lifted up? Nope. Was the church encouraged? Nope. Keep the main thing the main thing. Amen. So what? They don't believe this. So what? They I got in a debate one And it wasn't a debate. I just said, look, I'm, I'm, one guy asked me, he said, well, do you think it was angels that came down and had relations with the daughters of men? And there was giants in the land. And I said, you know what? I really don't believe that because uh, uh, angels are neutral gender. And, and how are we going to believe that angels can have a relationship with, with our women? And, and I said, no, I really don't. I, I don't. You would have thought, you would have thought I, I spit on the Bible. And I'm like, but listen, brother, what does it matter? Are you a brother? I'm a brother. So what? When we get to heaven, we'll get it sorted out. That interferes with us going out, reaching people for Jesus Christ. I know a good brother. He's a great, he's a great scholar of the Bible. He believes it. I ain't getting into it with him. I'm not going to sit there and say, I'm right and you're wrong, because he may prove me wrong. Huh? And then I look like an egg on my face. But either way, I don't know. There are things that, are, this is what I say, there are things in the Bible God just don't want us to know. We don't. Otherwise it'd be in the Bible. Otherwise it'd be in the Bible. So, Amen. But praise the Lord, we're saved. Amen. So they think. Yeah. Well, that's where that's where the 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 confusion is. It says the sons of men came and had relations with the daughters of men. Right? The sons of God came and had relations with the daughters of men. And what it is, those were those were the sons, and, and when, they, when, when people interpret that, they said the sons of God were angels. You don't know that. No. And the sons, the sons of God were actually, um, I don't remember right off the bat, I can't, can't say it, but Canaanites or whatever had daughters, had relation with. I know I've read it. Yeah. That's where it says that. What, what book is it in? Genesis. 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 And then there was giants in the land because of that. There was giants in the land. They said that Goliath, Goliath came out of that and everything. You know, and... But, but I, I, I'd say, well, I can't... Huh? Sure. Sure. Because there was a time, there was a time when there was this canopy upon the earth. And that canopy is... is they, they, you know, I, I've heard a whole, whole you know teach on it that... that 
that's that's why things were larger. It was the oxygen. Yeah. yeah, yeah, things were larger. The, the 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 vegetation was larger. Men lived longer. Animals were larger. Yeah. And and after the flood, that was taken away. No, it didn't. The water water didn't come from the sky. Water came from the ground. And so when the flood came, the Bible says that the water fell and then also came from the deep. There was gushes of water that came from the bottom as well. Yep. So, good stuff. Good stuff. I mean, it's great. Amen. Amen. And we can't get caught up in, in too much of, well, you you know, it, does you, you know, it, does you you know can't get caught up in if if somebody says, does your church really believe that? Well, that's what my pastor says. Well, I'll never go to church there. But what does it matter? If it's not if it's not con if it's not contrary to 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 you know the yeah exactly to to what the scripture says about salvation, then there shouldn't be an issue. But we get caught up in it. That's what. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I tell them all the time. I said, "That's fine, brother. You want to believe like that? I love you." I know. Hey, I know preachers that are divorced. Look, brother, if you want him to, have, you want him to be in your church and preach, you go right ahead. But I'm not. Yep. But that's the main thing. That's what that's what it's supposed to be, or until death do you part. Amen. <laughs> God help us. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We thank you for this time together. Bless us as we go our several way, Lord. We're thankful for it. And Lord, we just pray you'll bring us back safely tomorrow as we get ready for this uh, uh, retreat that we'll be going to. God, touch our hearts in a great way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.